Is it ready? I think it's time, right? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Learn Our Religion, which is our, our program. But of course, tonight's uh, series is ser um, lecture number three for Interpreter Foundation. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave at one point, so I'm telling you now, not like you said anything, and I'm going, huh, I'm out of here. I'm not, um, but I have it on the link. Um, I just wanted to welcome you all and say how fun it is to work with Steve Densley. We, we go back a ways, and, and this is great. So how this is going to work tonight, we're going to have an opening prayer and then I'm gonna, and, and then it'll go to Steve, and he will talk about some things tonight. And then when he introduces um, our speaker tonight, which is Christine Fredrickson, and uh, we're excited to have her here. And then at the end, if I guess if you do questions at the end, then Tom likes to run with it. And so there are more people out there in YouTube land watching this. So um, if you've all turned off your phone, that's phones, that's great. I just want to make sure that you know that this series that has six lectures, tonight is number three, and then it stops for the summer and starts back on again. And the first one is with Dan Peterson, and that's August 29th. So see, this is what? May, June, July, August, I mean, three months from now. He'll pick it up, but then it'll be almost every, every week or every other week. And then it's Kent Jackson and then Gail. Strathern. And so um, hopefully you all have that schedule and they'll also send out something from the Interpreter Foundation. Um, so because we kind of slow down a lot in the summer, we do have other, have other talks. So our Robert Millett series now, um, when he spoke a couple weeks ago, that's the stop for him. And then he starts back up in September schedules over there if you want it and then also dr john lund except he has one more so there will be nothing that's going to happen in this place next week the following week will be uh silver linings that's a female only support social group for single women in the church so that's here and so if you know any neighbor sister daughter um We'd like to have you come. That'll be Silver Linings, and that's two weeks from tonight. And then John Lund speaks the week after about grandparents and grandkids, how they share a common enemy. Yeah, share, the, share a common enemy. Can you figure out who that is in the middle? Anyway, it's a great talk, and so I invite you to do that. So at this point, our opening prayer will be given by Elizabeth Palmer, and at the end of it will be given by her husband, Dave Palmer. But... I will step away, um, we'll have our opening prayer. And do you want to take it to her and he can give you there? And then Steve will pick it up from there. Then you'll have your lecture and, and I'll proceed like that. Uh, we pray that they will be attentive and be able to understand and uh, absorb the things that we are taught and that we will uh, retain them and be able to uh, enjoy uh, this uh, information that we're receiving tonight and we're grateful for this opportunity. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. So on this point, we'll turn it over to Steve Densley. Can I just say, Tom, uh, Pittman is our technician, and I never want to forget how much you make our lives so much better because we trust you and you do a great job. So thank you very much, Tom. And thank you all for coming. And thank you for all you people out in YouTube land. And so now, Steve Densley. Okay. Um, remember what we say? Merhaba. Merhaba, right? Okay, so, so we've got some new people here. Let's say you say hello in Turkish, and uh, so you guys, you're gonna you're gonna have a crash course right now because we've got we've got three words now we're gonna work. So we got merhaba, and do you remember how we say thank you? Teşekkürler. Teşekkürler. 
Peshek, Peshek Yular. Right. So when, when Christine is finished, we'll tell her Peshek Yular. Right. And then, and then we'll also, as she's leaving, okay, we'll say Gule Gule. Okay. Gule Gule. Okay. It means bye bye. Okay. It also, it, it, it also literally is, is like go with a smile. Okay. Go, go away smiling. And I'm sure we all will after we've heard Christine's lecture tonight. So I want to introduce her to, for, for her lecture, Women in the Ancient Mediterranean World. I've been very excited. To, uh, to hear this lecture. I think it's such a fascinating topic. And, you know, it's maybe, uh, you know, might wonder why are we talking about women in the Mediterranean world if we're going to Turkey? Um, I mean, Tur Turkey has a Mediterranean border, of course, but we'll talk a lot of, you know, tonight about Greeks and Romans um, and, of course, the, the Jews. And uh, you, if you've heard the lectures on the Byzantines and the Ottomans, then you have a little bit better idea about why it might be relevant to talk about you know, the Romans and the Greeks. Uh, what, one of the interesting things that uh, we, we, we touched on a little bit with, with Eric Huntsman with the Byzantines is the, the code of Justinian. You know, Justinian was a Roman emperor in Constantinople. And the Justinian code, it, it codified earlier Roman law, brought that together, and it's still relevant today. It, it formed the basis for the civil code that's used in many places throughout the world. Um, in some respects, helped form the basis for our Bill of Rights. Uh, that's Roman law in Turkey. Okay? And that was the, you know, of course, that was the, 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 the head, that was the, the capital of the Roman Empire there in Constantinople. So um, definitely relevant to talk about what, what the, the Greek tradition is, the, the, the Roman tradition, of course, the Jewish tradition, um, as it all relates to women. Uh, so when we go to Turkey, uh, you put, put a little more of this in context as we're reading the New Testament. Some of these writings of Paul, maybe will make a little more sense. And, and so uh, with that, let me introduce Christine. Uh, Christine Wardle Fredrickson is a board member of the Interpreter Foundation. She'll be going with us also to Turkey. She received her Ph.D. in history from the University of Utah and has taught over 25 university courses in history, women's studies, honors and religion departments at the Brigham Young University and Utah Valley Universities. She was an op-ed writer for 10 years at the Deseret News and the Mormon Times. She is the author of Extraordinary Courage, Women Empowered by the Gospel of Jesus Christ. She's published on a wide range of historical and religious topics in books, periodicals, and presented at numerous conferences. Her areas of expertise include modern European history with an emphasis on 19th century Britain. And if you're lucky, maybe you can get her to take you on a tour to, to, to Great Britain. Uh, women's history and religious history. She and her husband, Reed, are the parents of six children and 11 grandchildren. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Fredrickson. I'm uh, used to um, standing for my lectures, so sitting will be really um, an experience for me, and I hope I stay awake. Um, <laughs> it's been a crazy few um, few weeks lately, but I am delighted to be here with you and to look at something that is just so appealing and intriguing to me. And, and I think there is great relevance as we look at these women, and we will sort of connect the dots as we talk about these women to that uh, Pauline experience when the missionaries take the world to the Gentile, take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Um, I'm going to just show you an outline. Don't be daunted by when you by this outline when it comes up, but um, we're going to talk about uh, four basic principles that help us better understand the ancient world. Then we're going to look at the power power in the uh, um, first, and instead of talking about the Mediterranean world, let's talk about it in terms of that first century world. So it transcends the time of Jesus Christ and goes on to the time of the apostles when they were very active, well, Paul and others were very active in what we call um, Turkey today. So we'll look at power and cultural influences in that first century Mediterranean world. The major influences at this time were Hellenism, Greco-Roman society, Judaism, and then, of course, Christianity comes on the scene with um, the um, uh, ministry of the Savior Jesus Christ. 
Um, uh, we will transition um, just a little bit of background in those areas. Then we're going to look at background, getting some background on Greek and Hellenistic world and some historical background. Then we will talk about Greco-Roman culture. And I won't go through all the other little details. We'll look at Judaism. We will look at Jesus's views on women. I must admit I'm in the middle of finishing one of the other uh, things. By the way, I have 12 grandchildren now. Um, but um, one of the manuscripts that I am working on, and I'm just wrapping up one on human trafficking, sexploitation, and the horrors of sexploitation. But the next book that I'm re-editing is on um, uh, Jesus and women. So we will look at Judaism, and then we will look at Jesus's views on women. Thank you. In the ancient world, and then we will look at um, Christianity in the first century AD. Uh, we might look, depending on time, um, at Mary Magdalene and her experiences, because they're sort of reflective of what rim, women's conditions were in Christianity. And then we will look at women in the post Jesus church. And hopefully, you're still awake for the conclusion. All right, let's talk a little bit about the four principles that will help us better understand this world that we are going to enter. Uh, ways of life um, and thinking were radically different at the time of Jesus Christ. As Camille Frank Olson said, quote, a vast cultural chasm separates us and the world of the past. The way ancient people thought, their social norms, their values, and cultural structure is remarkably alien to our contemporary way of life. So that's the first principle. The second principle is that we do not do ourselves any favor if we compare their beliefs and their views against our contemporary views from a sense of superiority. I would say that that's pretty flawed and there's a lot of hubris to do that, to think we know better than anyone that has previously lived in the world. So we cannot malign these people. And the way that we need to study them is we need to study them in the context of their beliefs. And generally their beliefs, there's a reason behind their beliefs. And we're certainly going to see that in some of the material that we're gonna cover here. The third principle here that's important is that it's hard to recognize how deeply people are affected by cultural traditions and practices. And how deeply we are influenced by the society around us. We're socialized to certain beliefs. I would say none more so than, than those of us that live in this world today because of the influence in the media in shaping our views um, on the world that we live in. But these people were very much shaped by the social practices and culture around them just as we are today. And then the fourth principle here is that Jesus and the early church leaders challenged many cultural practices in that first century church, uh, in that first century world. And then when the first century church came along post Jesus after his death, what we see is we see the apostles, they're still wrestling. They've been socialized to certain beliefs and practices, and it's very hard to jettison those beliefs and practices. And yet we're going to see them in very dramatic ways, oftentimes replace them with Christ's salvific doctrines and teachings, in particular in our case with regards to women. So let's look first at some of the power and cultural influences in the Mediterranean world. Uh, Jesus, and the early, Jesus and the early members of the Christian church, they lived in a vast Roman world. Um, you can see here Palestine here. If you're looking, I'm looking to the right here. You can see Palestine here. And then you can see that Roman um, world um, that um, uh, um, Palestine is part of and that Jesus and church leaders in the first century are going to be a part of. It began when Pompey conquered Jerusalem in 63 BC and then Judea became a client state of Rome by 37 AD and controlled all of Palestine. The effects of Roman overlordship on first century Palestine in the world where the apostles preached was deeply influenced by Hellenistic Greek, Hellenistic beliefs, by Greco-Roman beliefs, and by Jewish traditions. So we're going to take each one of those traditions and we're going to kind of break them down and look at them in their historical context. First of all, just a little bit of background on that ancient Greek Hellenistic world. So generally when we teach Greece, um, when I teach ancient um, history, um, it's broken up, Greek, is, Greek history is broken up into four periods. The Dark Ages, the Archaic 
period, but for our um, lecture and for our purposes, it's that classical age that is so influential and so important. This is the time period where we have those great thinkers. We have Aristotle, we have Sophocles, we have Diosthenes, we have you know great thinkers. And what's fascinating is that they were opining with regards to philosophy, the arts, architecture, religion, and science, and then they are going to go to war with the Persians. It's about a 50 year period of time. They have a series of battles with the Persians, but once they conquer the Persians who were the power in the ancient world, that vaunts the Greeks onto the world stage. And we start to see a little bit of the spread of their ideas and influence in the wider world. Uh, they're going to go to war among themselves, the Greeks, the, uh, the Athenians um, and their allies are going to create a league and then the Spartans and their allies are going to create the Peloponnesian League and we're going to have a series of wars that, is, that are going to weaken Greece. And when Greek is weak, that provides an opening for Philip II of Macedon. Now you can see Macedonia is up here in the top left, so it's above <clears throat> all of those Greek states that existed during this period of time. <clears throat> And Philip is going to swoop down and he's going to exert influence and take control basically of Greece. But then he's going to be succeeded by his son, Alexander. Now, Alexander, <clears throat> according to many, in fact, a good example is Napoleon. Napoleon oftentimes <clears throat> would moan and whine about how he had really achieved nothing. <clears throat> and he said that because he was comparing himself to Alexander the Great. And the success <clears throat> of Alexander in expanding his empire. And so Alexander is not going to be on the stage for a long period of time. His father is going to die. Some people say that there was a death that was exacerbated by Alexander's mother and Alexander. Nevertheless, he's going to take control of this empire. He's going to stabilize Greek society. He's going to take control of it. And then, of course, he is going to expand and he is going to diffuse Greek teachings throughout this vast empire that he has created. And that's going to last, that's going to take place between the time of the death of Alexander the Great. His empire is going to fracture into a number of different empires to the death of, um, of, of, um, <clears throat> of um, Cleopatra in Egypt. And so these ideas are going to be spread throughout the world. Now, let's talk a little bit about what it Hellenism is. Hellenism is the national character and culture of ancient Greece. Um, as I mentioned, it's dispersed in the Western world um, between the death of Alexander and then the death of Cleopatra. Has enormous influence on the arts, literature, theater, architecture, music, mathematics, philosophy, ways of dressing, politics, social mores. And Greek philosophy established a way of thinking that is still still at the foundation of what the Western intellectual tradition. If you take philosophy courses in the world today, you are going to spend an enormous amount of time and history classes. I did a lot of teaching on these great thinkers in my history classes as well. And what we see among the Greeks is there's a preference for reason, there's a preference for rational thinking, so thinking a problem through from beginning to end, and then a search for scientific explanations to explain the natural world. So hugely um, influential in those areas, but also in religion as well. It's polytheistic in Greece. There, of course, chief god is, supreme god is Zeus. But the Greek gods are quite whimsical in nature with human foibles. Um, personified. They have enormous power and they're pretty, um, you know, um, whimsical in their application. So they can make human lives pretty hellish for all intents and purposes. And humans are basically their playthings. Um, yet religious worship was very, very important for the Greeks. And every time they went to battle and every time they, and in any of the big cities, of course, we have these massive Greek temples where they worship. So they took their religion very seriously in Greece. Now, let's talk a little bit about women in, um, and, and we see this throughout history. We, we refer to what we call creation myths. We see these all over the world. We have a great tradition myth <clears throat> in the um, <clears throat> Christian tradition, in the biblical tradition. That's the myth of Adam and Eve. That's how it's referred to historically speaking. And the way that it shapes social mores and customs for individuals that live <clears throat> basically throughout history and really impacted, you know, the history of men and women in Christian based societies well up and into our day. <clears throat> The creation myth, however, that had an enormous influence in Greek society was Hesiod's theogony. 
and it is the standard Greek creation myth. It goes back to about 700 BC. And in this myth, we have Zeus, of course, this supreme god, and he's very unhappy with the god Prometheus. He has acted inappropriately according to Zeus's command. And Prometheus is pretty on the ball, but his brother, Epithemius, is pretty dumb. He's really pretty dumb. And so Zeus believes this is his entree into making Prometheus's wife, uh, life pretty miserable. And he is going to gift Epimetheus uh, a wife, and her name is Pandora. And as he describes her, she is an evil for mortal man. Uh, yet she is endowed with enormous beauty, grace, charm, cunning, curiosity in a box that she is never to open. So, you know, we hear that expression all the time, Pandora's box. Did you open Pandora's box? Well, eventually, of course, her curiosity gets the best of her. She is going to open that box and out flies all the horrors which plague the world today. Now, remember, it is Pandora that opens that box to the horrors that afflict the world today. Pain, sickness, jealousy, malice, envy, hatred. <clears throat> They're not able to recapture any of those horrors, but they are later able to introduce hope to sort of mitigate those horrors that have entered life. Now that myth established women as a tempting snare as a nagging burden to her husband. Okay, sometimes it's true, but sometimes it's not. And from Pandora we, uh, is described in this myth as comes the fair sex. Yes, wicked women folk are her descendants. So when we talk about theogony, it is invested with a deep symbolic and theological meaning for Greek society. And it established perceptions of women, that they are innately weak, that they are capricious in nature, even that they have a malevolent side to them. Consequently, for the safety and for the health of society, it's important that women be sequestered and that they be put under the control of men who are more reasonable and logical. <clears throat> This, of course, influenced the writings and the thinking of social leaders in Greek and Hellenistic society. Um, Greek men um, created conditions, excuse me, Greek men then are going to start seeing women through a sort of a pejorative lens, lens because of this uh, presentation of women. Literature is going to follow the tradition, influenced writers and thinkers during this period of time, commonly depicting women as inferior, less intelligent than men, uh, such that women be excluded from politics, from the military, from any public roles whatsoever. Aristotle himself opined, the female is, as it were, a deformed male. Uh, Sophocles, a woman's decency is found in her silence. Um, other applications of um, theogony resulted in men having lifelong control over women and making all decisions for them. Marital fidelity, of course, was required of women. However, it was socially acceptable for men to engage in illicit relationships. A Greek wife's duty was to refrain from gossip, to manage the household well, to produce legitimate children, especially sons, that would carry on the family lineage and name. Uh, women could own, but they could not sell property. The husband or the father had to approve that. If they went into public, and they rarely uh, wanted them in public, particularly consorting with men, they needed an escort in that public space. And oftentimes, if they had the financial means, they would create women's quarters in the home to kind of keep them sequestered. As Elizabeth Tetlow, the Greek historian, explains, Greek women, with a very glaring exception of Sparta, were generally sequestered in conditions that would make most modern observers think of 1001 Arabian Nights. Veils, limited access to public spaces, and later on even eunuchs guarding the women's chambers and keeping an eye on those women. We move on from Greek society to Hellenistic societies. We mentioned that transition to 325 uh, and uh, Alexander the Great, Great and his conquest. And when we look at then that transition to this period of time, Hellenistic to the Hellenistic um, society, we do see some new philosophical scientific ideas that allow some women to get an education, but there's still no class mobility whatsoever in Greek society or Hellenistic society. Marriages are arranged, usually before a woman is 14, and women were educated primarily in the domestic arts. 
The legal status of women did slowly improve. A few elite women accumulated enormous wealth, political power, and they could act as their own masters in society and business. Yet slavery was still practiced, and there were women that were set aside as prostitutes and many women slaves. Of course, their masters would sell them um, um, for their sexual services, and they were prey to sexual violence. Because society sanctioned prostitution for men with other men, with slave boys, with girls, with temple prostitutes, women came to be perceived as objects and commodities that you could buy and sell on, in the marketplace, which inevitably degrades and lessens the value, not just of the women that are being traded in that venue, but of all women in society. Overall, then, if we're looking at Hellenistic society, life was exacting, it was challenging for women, and what changes they did make to society really did very little to improve women's lives in Hellenistic society. So, and it's, as I mentioned, very influential when we get to the time period in which Jesus Christ and the early Christians lived. Now, ancient Rome and its rise and decline, we've got a period of kings. There were about seven kings that are recognized in uh, ancient uh, Roman society. They're going to advance their possessions militarily and economically and geographically. But this is where we start to see the very rudimentary beginnings of a constitution in Roman society. We transition then to about 510 BC when we have the Roman Republic. And this is generally a rule by the few, the upper class, Classes, but they create a standardized code of laws. And this is enormous for a society to have standardized laws. One of the flaws in French society, for instance, going right up until the French Revolution, is that they had no standardized codes of law. And so anytime you're taking goods to, from one place to another to sell in the market, you've got to deal with every single state or every single province, I should say, in France and different laws. And it, it holds back development and it holds back economic prosperity. So they they're starting to standardize codes of laws. And this is really where we also see in England where they standardize codes of laws, where England leaps ahead, you know, by um, leaps and bounds uh, against other societies in European society because they have standardized laws. What really helps the Romans is, of course, they become the dominant Mediterranean power in the Mediterranean world. And then they gain control of all of the Italian peninsula and then Corinth and Carthage. And these are great seafaring powers as well. And so they're going to be able to export. They're going to be able to not just export and trade widely around the Mediterranean, but they're going to be able to export their ideas as well. Um, we're going to devolve to the rule of um, uh, dictators. Um, the most famous, of course, is going to be Julius Caesar. He's going to basically come to power about 60 BC. He's going to be killed, of course, in 44 BC when he is assassinated on the Ides of March. And then there's going to be a period of civil war and eventually Gaius Caesar, uh, Gaius Julius Caesar Octavian. Octavian is the best way for us to refer to him, Augustus Caesar. Um, Octavian is going to come to power in 31 BC, where he is very important is of course he is going to be the emperor when Jesus Christ is alive, when Jesus Christ is born, and then that Roman Empire from 31 to 476 A.D. is emperors, one emperor after another, another, and we often get to we get to the point where we call them barracks emperors. They're military figures that have established enormous power. They have the loyalty of their soldiers and others in society, and so when one emperor dies, there may be a civil war, there may be a transition to power, but oftentimes civil war and it's going to be one empire after another. But they're still going to keep expanding the empire. They are ahead technologically speaking in terms of military power um, against their enemies and they're very advanced in their thinking militarily and eventually they're going to control is going to expand to three uh, continents. So Asia Minor, Europe, and um, oh, what's the other one? Um, and then that whole Egyptian area, Af Northern Africa. So an enormous empire. And then what we're going to see is obviously the pressures as they expand their borders more and more wider and wider. In order to protect their borders, there are pressures because there are bar barbarians, what we, you know, the Goths, um, the Visigoths, individuals, there are pressures because those people are moving moving about and they're looking for territory. So they're going to start pressuring Roman borders. Rome doesn't have the manpower of just Roman citizens to control their borders. It's virtually impossible. And so 
So they're going to start hiring these barbarians to help them control the borders. But eventually those barbarians are going to go in. They're going to sack Rome. We kind of talk about the time 476 AD, the end of the Western Roman Empire. But for our purposes, that Eastern Empire is going to continue for a much longer period of time. That is, of course, the Byzantine Empire, which, you know, we still will see so many remnants of and vestiges of in Turkey when we do our tour during this period of time. And that empire will continue until the 5th century AD. So they're enormously powerful. All right. What about Greco-Roman society? What are we meaning when we talk about Greco-Roman society? Um, these are individuals who have characteristics that are partly Greek and partly Roman. Now, let me explain very simply, in very simple terms, what that means. The Greeks and the Romans shaped Western civilization. Gre the Greeks set the table. Uh, Roman culture and practices were built upon Greek developments. The Greeks excelled at theorizing, at abstract thinking, in philosophy, in logic, in mathematics, in geometry, so much so that they're still closely studied today. The Romans advanced and developed philosophy, particularly political philosophy. If you've ever read Cicero, he's enormously influential in the U.S. Constitution, along with John Locke and others. But um, the, but the Greek um, advances in um, um, political philosophy were really quite striking. But where the Greeks really excelled was at the practical application. So building, they were highly skilled engineers, incredible engineers. Julius Caesar wanted a bridge across a river once, and they built it in a day um, um, because of their skill. And engineering skills, I was in Croatia several years ago, um, water is still being delivered by Roman aqueducts to many of the major cities in Croatia today. So they're very practical people, and they were very skilled engineers, builders, warriors, and politicians. Um, that Roman Empire in the first century AD, as I mentioned, Augustus Caesar ruled when Jesus was born. <clears throat> he died in 14 AD. He adopted Tiberius as his son. And Tiberius is going to rule till post-death of Jesus Christ, shortly after the death of Jesus Christ, until 37 AD. When Jesus Christ was born, the Roman Empire was about 2.2 million square miles. That's a vast amount of geography. And covers what today is 25 separate nations with about 50 to 55 million people under their control. Now, it's interesting to think of that in terms of when Jesus Christ commissions Paul and others and the disciples, the apostles, Peter and others. Peter, of course, has that extraordinary vision that he teaches to the other apostles, in, you know, about expanding the teachings of the gospel to the Gentile world. But imagine when this, you know, it was bad enough when Joseph Smith says we need to take the gospel to the world um, and what that meant for the early saints, but to try to take the gospel to a world of some 50, 55 million people where you are really a small group of people. Nevertheless, that's the magnitude of the task that faced uh, that post-Jesus um, Christian church. Um, the empire was built around a very strict social hierarchy. It was based on wealth, citizenship, gender, education, family connections, the favor of political rulers, uh, the favor of military leaders, and formal patron-client relationships. So it's very much about who you know, who you are in the Roman world. Elites controlled um, power, and they controlled the vast majority of the empire's resources. So what we get is we get a society of rich and poor poor with virtually no middle class, and of course, slavery is omnipresent in the Roman world. Where we're, uh, um, we really see some extraordinary benefits, so as I mentioned, we have um, Tiberius is going to come to power after Augustus Caesar, but Augustus Caesar was a genius. He was a, um, he was a, a political genius in the way that he established what's called the Pax Romana, and the Pax Romana was simply a set of common laws and then regulations that facilitated trade, that created stability generally and relative peace for nearly 200 years throughout this empire. Latin and Greek were the common and main languages, just as if you want to do business in the world today, you speak English. If you want to do business in the world back then, you spoke Latin and Greek. Um, G Jesus spoke Aramaic, and this was the language 
primarily, and, and there were other languages spoken as well, but the language of business and the language to get ahead were Latin and Greek. They had common weights, they had common measures, they created very, nobody was better at building roads. Roads are still in use today that were Roman roads. The way that they graded them, the way that they undergirded them to absorb the water for the water to drain out. So you will still find throughout European society and in England today, because of course Julius Caesar was there for in southern uh, England at least, but but those roads are still in use today, again, reminding us of their skills. But they have a very sophisticated road system. It's going to simplify travel. It's going to simplify communicating with one another. And it's also going to simplify the military if it needs to get to hot spots in the empire. Most of the people during this period of time are going to live in small villages, but there are large, large cities. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make in the world today is we look back on these ancient civilizations and we think they were so unsophisticated, which is as far from the truth as you can possibly. They may, they might, may not have had our technological advances, but they certainly were extraordinary in many of their advances. If you have been to England and you go to, where is it that they have the Roman boss? Oh, in Bath. All right, in Bos, and they heated their villas with uh, with hot water. They would run it. They would find these hot water sources, and they would run it under the villas. So they had hot water in those villas. And so here are these people. Most of them are living in small villages, but in those large cities, as I mentioned, sophisticated aqueducts that are going to deliver fresh water. They're going to be used in the public baths, in fountains, in drainage, sewer, and heating systems. So they had a way to you know, to get the sewer out of those villas and out of those cities. They established theaters, they established amphitheaters, gymnasiums, forums, temples, shrines, and vast monuments. Um, those later forums are going to become a public space for markets, for socializing, for meeting, for political debates and discussions. When Paul and the apostles are going to take the gospel to the wider world and to the Gentiles, the Pax Romana is going to facilitate their ability to travel and generally travel safely, but it's also going to provide, besides a forum, besides synagogues, those forums are going to provide them places for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, as well as being politically sophisticated, um, the Roman Empire was a military empire and it developed, depended on cutting edge, a well-functioning military and one with an appetite for physical cruelty. The response of the Romans to any perceived threat or challenge was to crush it. No matter how many times you had to go back, as long as it took, as many times as it took, as many resources as it took, they wanted the message to be out there. You come against us and we will, um, inevitably, we will crush you. And one of the ways that they did this was certainly siege machines. They were excellent at that. Um, also, their um, practice of um, the phalange fighting was absolutely extraordinary. Crucifixions on a very large scale, and intentionally so. Publicly, they wanted to send a message that you would suffer an ignominious death. Those crucifixions were vicious, they were humiliating, and they were intended to warn others against rebellion. And it was but one tool in their brutal arsenal, which included slaughtering extended family members of those accused of crimes, grinding tortures, gladiatorial shows, um, feeding individuals, <clears throat> later Christians, of course, to the lions when the Christians fell in and out of favor uh, during that first century AD. Just one simple example, in 71 AD, 6,000 slaves were crucified along the Appian Way. Uh, many of us know about this when we know the story of Spartacus, who led that slave uprising. So you get a sense of the power and might of these people. Now, that first century Roman Empire, on a positive note, the Romans were very good at assimilating conquered populations. They would extend citizenship to certain non-Roman groups, and they would extend subordinate um, rule to some of the local elites. So they did hold some power and influence in the empire. They tried to rule with latitude and flexibility as long as you weren't creating problems. Obviously, the Jews didn't get that message and they're gonna eventually be destroyed. 
Um, but there was flexibility in their rule. They generally tried to respect local traditions and sensibilities. And this made it easier for Rome to assimilate conquered people and territories into their social uh, customs and their political institutions. It also presented a picture of permanence and stability that made um, people that might consider going to war against them loathe to do so. The women in Greco-Roman society were considered property of their husbands. They had no rights, they had no free will, they had no citizenship. As the Roman Republic grew, women gained some freedom and some were allowed to participate in daily social life, but they never gained citizenship. They did, however, gain the right to own land, to run certain businesses, to inherit wealth, and to pursue certain occupations and make wills. This is primarily among elite women, but even if they made wills, they had to have the approval of their husband to, um, to put in the provisions and to carry out the provisions of the, well, of the wills. Um, with no citizenship for women, um, um, they still, however, could legally inherit and hold property, but as I mentioned, they could not dispose of this at their will either. Husbands and fathers retained ultimate authority, extending to life and death over their families. By law, fathers were required to raise all their male children to adulthood, but only the firstborn female. So the other daughters, if you had no inclination to keep them alive, you could sell them into slavery and you could expose them, leave them uh, out until they're exposed and die. Uh, legally, women uh, throughout their lives were akin to minor children in the eyes of the law. Arius Didymus wrote to Caesar Augustus, quote, a man by nature has rule over his household, for the deliberative element or faculty is worse in a woman, is not yet in children, and is not at all in slaves. So at least we're at the top of that heap as women. Cicero had this to say, he's a wonderful political theorist, extraordinary political theorist, but he said, our ancestors have willed that all women, because of their lack of judgment, should be under the power of guardians, meaning, of course, under the power of men. <clears throat> now, I mentioned Roman aristocratic women did have some power, and over time, Roman matrons enjoyed a degree of freedom, wealth, and independence that Greek women never experienced. They could be patrons to others. They were pretty much freed from household work. I should be so lucky. They could go to the public market. They could go out to festivals and banquets, and they could mix in mixed company, which was really quite an advance. They could make certain economic, cultural, religious, and political contributions. Um, some well-known women even petitioned the Senate, and a few even demonstrated, there's some record of them demonstrating against laws that they thought were oppressive. So over time, free women became a little more independent. They could divorce, they could remarry, but the children always went to the father and um, they were still under their um, father's or their husband's control if they remarried. Uh, they were to respectfully worship from the pantheon of Roman gods. Roman gods are basically Greek gods renamed. So it's pretty much as simple as that. But again, religion was very important in Greco-Roman society as well, that you perform all of those religious ordinances so that you had the pleasure of the gods in your favor, particularly when you went to war. Uh, the women were to be modest, virtuous, demure, quiet, and efficient. They were to be dedicated, faithful wives, mothers, maintain harmonious, well-functioning homes under the husband's leadership. Under Augustus Caesar, mutual consent was the primary form of marriage. Now, let me tell you, in reality, this was certainly not always the case. Augustus Caesar had a daughter, Julia, at the age of 12. Uh, in the ancient world, women were pawns for expanding your political or territorial power. And so he's going to marry his daughter off at 12, the man that's going to become the head of the empire. He dies. She's going to be married again at 14. She is pretty much out of control and makes her father's life a living Hades. That's a nice way of putting it. Uh, she's involved in numerous adulterous affairs. He finally is going to have to um, just put her into um, you know, a villa and keep her sequestered and away from the public. But this was the model that was established that women were to follow. It was irresponsible for women, for anyone really, to marry for love or out of physical attraction. Uh, most girls waited, but girls could marry at age 12, 
And although it was physically dangerous for women to engage in sexual relations at such a young age, Roman men desired brides, quote, pure and undefiled in body and mind when their husbands took them. And so that's why it was allowed. Uh, as I mentioned, some women um, rose to power. Some women were also educated if it was appropriate to their station or the occupation that they held. But even if they went into the public sphere, there was often opposition to them being in that public sphere. Aristocratic women could be classically, and some were classically educated, and so we have the writings of some absolutely exquisite poets, some paintings of painters, women were physicians, historians, lawyers, writers, and they convened salons. You'll remember those French salons at the time, around the time of the French Revolution. These women had extraordinary power then and um, during the French Revolution, because what they were able to do is, as they convened these salons, they were able to invite certain people in and exclude certain people from those salons. That made them the movers and shakers in their particular societies. They could, you know, uh, enhance the rise of someone's power in society. They could diminish the rise of someone's power in society. So this put women into a powerful position. And we often, you know, in these lectures we're talking about formal power. But the reality is, is that throughout history, women have also exercised informal power in numerous ways. And because of that, because of having informal power, they have, able, they have been able to exercise formal power through their husbands or others who they, whose lives they have impacted in extraordinary ways as well. Um, uh, uh, lower class women, in some ways they were freer than women, they could, than um, aristocratic women. They could sell merchandise in the markets, they could serve as money lenders, laundry women, waitresses. Um, um, but generally, these women too had a very rudimentary education and again only trained in the domestic arts. Uh, some did advocate for women and stood up for women, and um, uh, the philosopher Seneca described that women had the same inner force and the same capacity for nobleness as men. Others opposed, Juvenal was a very famous and widely respected poet. He mocked educated, articulate women. The lawyer magistrate Pliny the Younger praised his wife for staying silent and hidden while she would watch him speak in public. He described, if I am giving a reading, she sits behind a curtain nearby and drinks in every word of appreciation for me and of course applauds me as well. Again, trying to establish a standard how women, how, as to how women were to behave in society. Um, religious worship was modeled after um, um, the Greek gods, um, differently named. Worship was dominated by men, but there was a certain group of women known as Vestal Virgins that had ceremonial roles in um, religious um, sacrifice and other religious practices. The sexual double standard was enshrined in law. Adultery was a capital offense for any woman. But men consorting with prostitutes was not only accepted, but it was widely promoted. Again, the widespread sexualization of society um, and the sexual double standard relegated women to being seen as sexual objects and dehumanized them in many respects in men's eyes. And yet again, we see testimonials praising uh, individuals' mothers and individuals' wives who were dedicated to their husbands and families. And this was critical to the stability of those societies as well. In fact, we oftentimes, and this is true, we oftentimes talk about the decline of societies. And one of the key ingredients when societies begin to implode or are in this state of implosion is that the nuclear family disintegrates. But what's fascinating, and particularly because I do human trafficking and particularly children into sexual servitude, is when you really see a society in free fall is when you see society no longer protecting their children. And I would suggest we're certainly seeing that in many aspects of our society today. Um, so overall, Greco-Roman world, very varied, very multifaceted law and social codes favored men. Women were legally inferior, though some Roman males spoke highly of women, um, <clears throat> but and uh, spoke highly of their the role they played in everyday society and their value to um, society in raising good, strong families. But in comparison to most simple Roman men, women were in bondage, uh, Jeannie and Richard Holzhopfel noted, as evidenced by both the positive and negative statements about women from Greco-Roman sources. It would be correct to conclude that 
quantitatively and qualitatively, the negative attitude vastly outweighed the positive. All right, let's look at Judaism and how Judaism perceived women. First thing we need to understand when we're talking about Jews is that Jews loom large, of course, in biblical studies, and yet they were a very tiny minority in that Greco-Roman world of some 55 million people. Uh, Palestine was pretty much the backwater of the Roman Empire. No Roman wanted to be assigned <laughs> to Palestine um, just because it was, um, it was a backwater. They were seen as very backward, and the Jews were seen as so obstreperous and just a nightmare to work with, which they did prove to be to the Romans. And so they just didn't want to be there. But we sometimes think of them as bigger players on the world stage than they really were. Um, the whole of Palestine was about 7,500 square miles, 150 miles north to south, about 50 miles wide, and it was peppered with about 200 small villages. Judaism is monotheistic. It's, it's monoistic, actually. Monoistic meaning one God. I'll just jump a little off here, but one of the things that you, you have to understand is one of the problems for Jesus Christ's disciples was that they were raised in a society that believed in one one God, period. The idea that there was a Godhead and that Jesus Christ was a God incarnate as well as the Son of God was so difficult for them to wrap their minds around because Judaism did not embrace that idea whatsoever. There was one God and one God only that individuals were to worship. And so that's one of the problems that uh, Christianity had to deal with, but they are monotheistic. There are a number, an enormous number of individuals, nevertheless, in that society um, uh, Ju Judaism, in Judaism that were power brokers. There were the zealots, there were the Pharisees, there were the Sadducees, and those are all going to be power brokers. Um, and all of those people are going to have different ways of viewing Judaic law. And so, but one of the things we do find is that they're, they are going to be united under several different concepts. Now, as far as Jews, what did they believe? They believed that one, e that one eternal God created the universe, that they were his chosen people, that they were duty-bound to obey his laws. They were in a covenant relationship with him. They were to be a light to the Gentiles and to lead others others to accept the God of Israel as the one true God. Um, they strove to exist as a separate entity in a distinct community because of their religious practices, because of their dietary practices in the wider Roman Empire. And the, one of the things that really aided them in doing so was in 63 BC, they proved the salvation of uh, Julius Caesar at the Battle of Pelusium. And so they were granted extensive civil um, uh, legal rights. They would have the right to assemble. They had freedom of worship on their Sabbath day, which was different than worship in um, many other um, uh, polytheistic traditions. They had the right to govern themselves to a degree and to tax themselves to a degree, money that they um, taxed. And this is one of the reasons, too, that tax collectors were so hated among the Jews, because the tax collectors were not just collecting taxes for the Roman Empire, but they were collecting collecting taxes for the Jewish leaders as well. So it was a body of individuals that were so extraordinarily poor and the on onerous, you know, that they had to deal with because they had these, this double taxation. That money, of course, that they taxed the Jews, that went to the Jews, was to use to maintain Jerusalem and to maintain that temple. Um, the Jews believed that, um, that um, not only should they remain separate and apart, um, <clears throat> but they um, believed that they should have the right and they were given the right by Julius Caesar to um, establish their own courts of law. Now, one of the things we see and we understand, of course, with Jewish, with Jesus, Jesus' trial, he's certainly convicted by the Sanhedrin, isn't he? But what's the problem? They don't have the power to execute him, do they? They're not given the power to execute him, and so they've got to parade him around to Pilate and to you know, uh, Herod and to these others until they can get the Romans to agree to execute him. But they did have their own law courts. Uh, they were exempt from emperor worship, and they were exempt from military service. And this was the only group in the entire empire that had these kind of rights extended to them. 
Um, most Jews believed, of course, that Israel, it's going to become Palestine, was the religious cosmic center of the world, and they lived in the hopes of a glorious future where the Messiah, much like King David, would come and rescue them from physical, political, and spiritual oppression. This is why a lot of Jews had problems with Jesus. Even his Christian followers were looking for not just someone who is going to bring them you know, spiritual salvation, but they were looking for the leader that was going to physically liberate them from the Romans. And then when they were liberated, they were lived free and prosperous. As I mentioned, Jerusalem, the heart and soul of Jewish religious life, life, and the temple was the symbol of Judaism. And that's where national, cultural, religious, and political life all came together in one on that temple mount. Now, prominent pawnbrokers, I mentioned a few. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Herodians, the Zealots. They all variously interpreted the Torah, but all of them shared certain beliefs. One God. They're in a covenant with God as his chosen people. They are to obey his laws and to honor and revere him. Um, where their power comes is certainly in taxing the people, but also sacrificial offerings. Any sins required a sacrificial offering. You're going to pay a lot of money to do that. Those offerings are vicariously performed by priests at the Jerusalem temple. That alone is going to impart enormous power to the Jewish leaders. But then there is also <clears throat> this idea as they establish purity codes for the people, what is clean and what is unclean. And purity is achieved by ritual cleansing, from hand washing to immersion in a mikvah. Jewish leaders determined and enforced the penalties for sin and regulated ritual cleanliness, so an additional layer of power and control over the people. 90% of the population were peasants, no public voice, fighting to keep their heads above water, small landholders, um, especially disdained among the people were tax collectors, prostitutes, thieves, the disfigured, the chronically ill, and the diseased. That poverty-stricken 90% of the population was ruled by really 1% makes up the ruling class, but 10% were among the elites. 9% are in lesser government positions in the upper ranks of the priesthood. They're well-heeled merchants, but 1% um, um, uh, when we talk about the Sanhedrin and that ruling class, only 1% of the people. And that 10% is going to shamelessly exploit their own people with high taxes and rents. And even a few Jews enjoyed uh, Roman citizenship and, con uh, ex and combined with the Jews to exploit, uh, and combined with the Romans to exploit the Jews. Now, one of the things we sometimes fail to realize is that there were more Jews that lived outside than inside Palestine during this period of time. Perfect example is first century Alexandria, Egypt. You'll remember this is where you know Mary and Joseph. I don't really think of them as you know. Um, you know, people that are fleeing, they're, they're fleeing for their life, but I'm not sure that I would call them, you know, people that are seeking, you know, uh, f uh, to, uh, people that are, what's the word for people that, uh, pardon, asylum. Yeah, they were seeking asylum. They go to Egypt. Egypt had a, um, an expatriate community of 200,000 Jews. And so, and, and they were appreciated in the Roman Empire. The Jews were always, you know, kind of second class citizens, but they were appreciated because they were good workers and they were dedicated uh, individuals. But they're still in the empire, they're still kind of associated there with the outcast women at the bottom of society. But we find um, expat communities in Egypt, 200,000, as I mentioned, in Alexandria. We also find them all over Turkey. And this goes back to the fourth century BC. Uh, they're in Anatolia, they're in the cities of Iconium, they're in Ephesus, they're in Galatia and other cities during Roman control. Uh, religious and dietary practices set the Jews apart, and so they built on place very close to their synagogues, and those synagogues were not just for worship, that's where they held their communal gatherings, that's where they held their trials, that's where they arranged for the care of the poor and others that had come to their communities, that's where Torah school was held. 
And then, of course, later on, many of these synagogues are going to be prime locations for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ by Jesus and by his apostles. So here's the Jews, and they are seeking to, to, you know, to maintain their distinct identity and religion, but they are certainly influenced by Roman law, Roman ideas, and by Greek values and ideas of class and status. Uh, Yale professor of ecclesiastical studies, Jan Pillikin, said, in the final analysis, variety and commonality are equally important to understanding Palestinian Judaism in Jesus' day. Jews agreed on many basic aspects of their religion and way of life, and they agreed that they did not want to surrender their covenant with God to accept the lure of pagan culture. But when it came to details, they could disagree with one another violently and with others violently as well. All right, what were women's conditions like? The Torah stipulated the continuity of family life. Uh, the continuity of unity within the Jewish community and unity within the family home and property being of supreme importance. By law, husbands were to provide their wives with clothing, with food, with sexual relations to maintain family lines. In the Old Testament, there were 247 laws, but by Jesus' day, they had added an enormous number of laws. Now, 617 laws on the books that Jews are to obey, and 100 of those laws constrain women in some way. In theory, while women were held in high regard, <coughs> practically speaking, Jewish women enjoyed um, in significant rights in the Old Testament, but in that intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jewish women's standing deteriorated significantly. They had few rights. They were little respected. They had no um, voice. They were the legal property of men, little to no formal education. If women were able to read the Torah at all, it was generally because their fathers <coughs> or teachers of the Torah. In public, they were not to speak to men. They had to veil. If they didn't, it was grounds for divorce. They were relegated to the home. If male guests came to meals, the women were excluded from those gatherings. Unable to eat at the table, fathers arranged the marriages. Concubines were legal, but you saw this very rarely in Jewish society. Divorce was wholly the prerogative of the man. Uh, for almost anyone that offended them, men could, women could not vote, no political voice, not allowed as witnesses in court, because they were held to be inherently liars, so you could not trust their word. Women could go no farther, farther than the outer court of the temple, the women's court as we know it. In the synagogue, they could not read scripture to the congregation and were not allowed to recite evening or morning prayer and under the complete control of their husbands and fathers. Men <coughs> were to work the land. They went out into that public sphere. They directed the marketplace, oversaw commercial ventures, exercised political, religious, legal power, and determined the social norms. Literature, literature set gendered boundaries. The Torah in the Talmud, you read, greater is the, well, I'm going to skip that one, but the idea that how to, it's always interpreted, it was always interpreted, it seems to be a positive um, description of women, and yet it was, um, it was interpreted negatively. But the Talmud praised women at times. A, wife, a man without a wife lives without joy, blessing, and good. A man should love his wife as himself and respect her more than himself. Yet by Jesus' day, women were in a servile relationship to their husband, and quote, they were obliged to obey her husband as she would a master indeed. This obedience was a religious duty. So they're in the home, they're baking bread, they're cooking the meals, doing the laundry, spinning thread, weaving cloth, as work which the wife was required to perform for her husband. It was critical they gave birth, preferably to sons, to perpetuate the lineage. Childcare was, of course, women's work. Men oversaw the instruction of their sons in Torah school. Customarily, they were betrothed by their fathers, and the father was paid a marriage price, and this happened at a very young age. One of the things that really set women apart was menstruation, um, <clears throat> made them ritually unclean, and this was critical in that you were um, ritually clean in Jewish society. Whatever women touched when they were in the process of menses, whether sitting, walking, brushing against, 
uh, if they brushed against a man, it made that person ritually impure. And so to not contaminate men, women were relegated to women's quarters. At times, they were even pushed out of the home if it was poor, a poorer home, and they simply had to sleep and live outside the home until, of course, they had participated in that ritual washing in the mikvah. Um, at times, women even performed tasks that ritually defiled them in order for men to avoid defilement. Marriage and family law favored men. One well-known rabbinical dictum, quote, the woman says the law is in all things inferior to the man. And this was egregiously applied with regards to divorce. It was, as I mentioned, the husband's prerogative. Although there were two rabbinic schools of thought, the first was the school of Shammai, Jesus aligned himself in many respects with this school. A man may not divorce his wife unless he has found unchastity in her. And yet there was the school of Hillel. Divorce is acceptable if a wife spoils a dish for him, if she finds no favor in his eyes, if he's just tired of her and wants to get a new wife. And this became the standard practice following the school of Hillel during Jesus' time. Uh, the uh, Jewish historian Jos Josephus explained, for with us it is lawful for a husband to initiate divorce, but for a wife, if she departs from her husband, she cannot of herself be married to another unless her former husband put her away. And describing women's circumstances, Camille Franck Olson said, perceiving women as chattel to be discarded at will, Jewish law allowed a man to divorce his wife for any reason. This was in contrast to Jesus who considered marriage to offer similar, similar rights to men and women and placed equal responsibilities to preserve the sanctity of marriage on both husbands and wives. <clears throat> talked about they could rarely engage in any work outside the home. They could do work if they performed it in the home, and then they could sometimes take goods and food to markets and sell there. They certainly were the midwives in society. They were the public mourners, and men did not want to be ritually defiled by touching the dead, and so women had the, um, the prerogative to prepare the dead for burial. Um, if there was any economic interest in a family, the interests of the male sons superseded those of the uh, daughters. They rarely owned property, and because the Jews were so poor and really held very little property except for that echelons of Jewish society, this pretty much doubly damned Jewish women because they were among the poorest women in the world to begin with, and now um, this kind of treatment. Strict standards of modesty, of course, applied to women. In fact, if, women, if a man's attention was drawn to a woman, it was the woman, not the man, who was charged with having impure thoughts or creating impure thoughts in the mind of the man. So overall, as um, uh, Joachim Jeremias explains, there were plenty of disdainful opinions expressed on women. We have, w therefore, the impression that Judaism in Jesus' time had a very low opinion of women, as is usual in the Orient, where she is chiefly valued for her fecundity, is the word, but fertility for our purposes, kept as far as possible, shut away from the outer world, submissive to the power of her husband or her father, and where she is inferior to men from a religious point of view. Only against this background can we fully appreciate Jesus' attitude toward women. All right. Jesus' attitude on women. I'll go really quick through this. Um, <clears throat> oh, no. Quite the contrast to what we see in the Hellenistic, Greco Roman, and Judaic society. Uh, many men made, um, many women made critical contributions. Um, Jesus, well, we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at two aspects. For first, we will look at uh, Jesus' teachings on women, and then we're going to look on how they're practically applied in the Christian church during Jesus' lifetime and then at his death. And what we see is we see many women make critical contributions to Christianity in its earliest years. Jesus couldn't have done what he did without the women that were there that were providing him money, that were providing him places to stay, that were providing him meals, that were taking care of a lot of the setup, a lot of the feeding of individuals, um, as, of Jesus and his disciples as they moved about sharing the salvific uh, doctrines that, they, that Jesus Christ had taught. So they were very supportive of Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke to women in public, a no-no. He spoke to them in private on an equal par with men. You remember the example of the Syrophoenician woman, the Gentile woman? She persists in her appeals that Jesus, please, please heal my daughter. And 
<clears throat> you know, his apostles are like, get rid of her, get her out of here. Uh, but Jesus actually begins a discussion, a conversation with the woman on this matter, such that after he has talked with her for some period of time, he concludes, oh woman, great is thy faith. He has a respect for her ideas and her thoughts, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And also indicating his respect for women's, beside indicating his respect for women's minds and their capacity to think, he used this example to reinforce the doctrine that the ministry of God was not limited to particular groups and that men weren't superior to women, but it was available to all persons. Christian women in the first century AD, Jesus ate meals with women. This, as we know, a frequent visit to the home of Mary and Martha. We know about Peter's ringing declaration when he attests that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. But Mary offers a testimony on a par with Peter's when, with her ringing declaration. <clears throat> Prior to the resurrection of her brother Lazarus, she says, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So they have the capacity to have that kind of spiritual level that men do in the world, which was something you simply did not see, um, uh, that kind of thinking in Jewish society. Matthew, Mark, Luke all record that when Jesus was arrested, women remained firm while male disciples fled. It was women that followed him through the process of the tile, and it was a long, laborious, torturous process that he went through from being you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane to being arrested, to being taken for Ananias and Caiaphas, and then on through all of those Roman political rulers. But they were with him lockstep all the way while his disciples um, fled. And then they followed him to the cross, and they were there at the cross, and then they followed him to the tomb, an initial preparation. And then, of course, in going back to prepare his body further after the Sabbath, they were the individuals that were chosen to be by Jesus Christ, I would suggest, as the first witnesses of his resurrection. You have to realize Jesus Christ had a short three-year public ministry, and everything he did during that time was very deliberate and very intentional. So he is spending a lot of time trying to elevate the status of women on a par with men. And so if it's a woman that's going to be the first one as a witness of Jesus Christ's resurrection, that would have to have been a very deliberate decision by Jesus Christ as well. And of course, it is Mary Magdalene being the first that sees the resurrected Lord. And then other women who, of course, run back and tell the apostles. And how do the apostles respond? Oh, you're telling us tales. They don't believe it, do it, because, again, that perception of women. You know, they're trying to learn and they're trying to change, but it's going to be a long process. So these combined um, events reflect the prominent historical spiritual roles that were played by women as disciples in Jesus Christ's ministry. Now, Mary, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do these two slides, but there's been a lot of new scholarship on um, uh, Mary Magdalene, and she's been trashed. Um, from everything that we find in a lot of the new apocryphal writings, in the dialogue of the Savior, these are ancient apocryphal texts, um, in the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, the so in, in the documents like the Sophia of Jesus Christ, we see a very different, you know, she is perceived very differently. She is seen as a woman who understood completely the Lord's teaching. She's presented that way. She has been given authority over all things as children of light with the um, 12 apostles. Um, she is described as one who always walked with the Lord, and she was loved more than all of the disciples. Uh, in the Pista Sophia, she's preeminent among the disciples. The Savior says of her, your heart is directed to the kingdom of heaven more than all your brothers. She's going to intercede sometimes on behalf of the disciples, and she's prominently portrayed as a prophetic visionary. Um, suggesting, of course, um, not only is she a visionary, but she receives private instruction secrets from the Savior that she later shares with the apostles. So, after Jesus Christ's death, what is it like for women in the ancient world? They continue in prominent roles in the early church. They were likely women were, in, I mean, it's just a given almost that women were the vast um, were numerically um, 
many more women were members of the church than men in that first century Christian world. The letters of Paul are fascinating. They provide solid information about many faithful Jewish Gentile women, vivid clues about some of the activities in which women are engaged. Um, that's Paul, not Jesus. Paul warmly greets Prisca, Junia, Julia, and Nereus' sister. Um, who are working and traveling as missionaries in pairs with their husbands or their brothers. One of my chapters in my book, Extraordinary Courage, is on Priscilla or Prisca. Um, Paul adored, and uh, she is really pretty much the only woman in scripture where there is a husband, where she's often mentioned first in scripture before her husband. But she and her husbands are not only missionaries, but they're going to hold conclaves, meetings in different centers, Ephesus and other places, where saints and um, where missionary work is carried out. And they're, even Paul even mentions he risked their lives to save his. So he praises them. He praises Junia as a prominent apostle imprisoned for the gospel's sake. Mary, Persis are commended for their hard work. Euodia, um, uh, Sintichi are described as Jesus's fellow workers in the gospel. Um, so all of the above indicate that women were included. They were active in spreading the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And after Jesus Christ's death, Paul's letters are insightful into the inner workings of these ancient Christian communities. They're meeting primarily in homes. That's sort of the woman's domain. And in that domain, they're gonna play key roles and hold leadership positions in prophesying. They're called upon to preach, to teach, to go on missionary journeys. They're in formal position in the church's deaconesses. And I'm not talking about keys, priesthood keys, but understand that we're talking here is that they're, as defined, Mind, being a deaconess was mean, meant that you were called to assist in the church ministry, which they were. And a deacon means someone who is a servant or helper. Aphia, Prisca, Lydia, Nympha, <clears throat> all of them um, um, held um, uh, roles, prominent roles in the church, and there were other offices where women played significant parts in group worship. When Paul greets the deaconess Phoebe, he assumes that women in that congregation are praying, prophesying during the worship services. The four daughters of Philip are described as prophetesses, and women participated in spirit-inspired public speech, preaching, and teaching. So I wanted to end sort of on that note so we get a sense of what it was like for women in this ancient world and how really revolutionary, Jesus Christ was a revolutionary in many respects, wasn't he? But one of the key things that he did is he wanted to elevate the status of women and make a place for them on a par with men as equals salvation as available to women as it was to men. And he did that. So let me just end up here. In, in myriad ways, Hellenistic, Greco-Roman, Jewish traditions and social codes, codes constrained, stigmatized, and devalued women. It limited their ability to exercise agency to progress spiritually. As Christian activist Josephine Butler rightly stated, quote, among the great typical acts of Christ, which were evidently and intentionally for the announcement of a principle, for the guidance of society, none were more markedly so than his acts towards women. Search throughout the gospel history and observe his conduct in regard to women, and it will be found that the word liberation expresses above all others the act which changed the whole life and character and position of the women Jesus dealt with and which ought to have changed the character of men's treatment of women from that time forward. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, just wondering, uh, in the modern Muslim world, how women are treated by our country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which ones have retained the old school? Mm -hmm. who, who is embracing it? Yeah, no, it is very much country by country in the modern Middle East and in African society as well. There's an enormous number of African, uh, Muslims, particularly in Northern Africa. But in other countries, I was in uh, Ghana and Uganda. In Ghana, if you go up north, 
Tomalay up there. It's hot and dry, miserably hot and dry, and very humid. Well, I shouldn't say no, hot and dry, so miserably hot. But um, it, it's predominantly Muslim, and and it and it's just it's country by country. Um, some countries very much constrain women. I mean, just just wearing the burqa, it's dangerous. You you don't have your peripheral vision. You're in black. You're going to be sweating to death. You're going to trip a lot. You can't see what's going on around you. Um, I, I did an article for Mormon Times, actually, and in that article, I, I had a number of young Muslim men live with us in our home. I loved them. They were delightful young men. They loved American society. They loved the freedom it provided. They loved American women. They would never marry them. They're going to go home and they're going to marry whoever is chosen for them to marry. Um, but they just loved the freedom there. But their sisters and their daughters couldn't drive. In, uh, this was in Riyadh, um, Saudi Arabia, and they've just started to loosen that up in Riyadh. Uh, in Dubai, of course, it's a much more open society. Uh, some societies were much more open, and then they're taken over by Iran. Certainly under the Shah, the Iran was progressing, and women were in business and had jobs, and they did not have to veil at all. They often wore very modern clothing, and then you get the takeover by the um, the um, those Iranian uh, mullahs, and uh, women are in disastrous position there. We see the disastrous position of Afghanistan. And so it just depends country by country. What about Turkey? Turkey, um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's it, it is, it is, how would I describe it? It is the uh, kind of, it's that Turkey has always tried to create that model of a, a more liberated society, and they are more liberated. Women are much freer in Turkey than you will see in many other places in, in the um, Muslim world. If you're going on the tour, you're going to see that. You're going to see women all over the place. Some will veil, some don't. And in my article for Mormon Times, this is what I, this is what I focused on. I focused on the fact, and my, my, actually one of my students brought it home because, you know, Deseret News sells off your articles. And so this has been published in a, um, in a um, Muslim journal in um, Saudi Arabia. But my argument was that if a woman chooses to wear the veil, more power to her. We choose to wear a garment. And we do that out of devotion and love for God. It's our expression of our love for our Father in Heaven. It has way greater significance if, you know, you read Nibley and stuff and, you know, some of those apocryphal documents um, that we have now. But um, when a woman chooses to wear a veil, more power to them. But to force the wearing of the veil, this is where, to my mind, it can be problematic. Mm -hmm. Yep. So one of the things I think that your lecture did really strongly was illustrate how much Jesus Christ departed from the, the, you know, the history and the culture and, the, and you know, the environment that he was in. Yeah. One of the things that struck me about this, though, because I've always seen the Gospels as being sort of uh, not really histories, but more arguments to demonstrate or testimonies that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so, you know, let's draw on the Old Testament and prophecies of the Messiah to illustrate how Jesus Christ was fulfilling those. And I'm going to have to look now at the Gospels as also demonstrating about how Jesus was a sort of revolutionary in terms of women's standing mm -hmm. in society. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, why, why are, what does that have to do with Jesus being the Messiah? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not really fulfilling any prophecies I can think of, mm -hmm. but for some reason the Gospel writers highlight this. Mm -hmm. and, and they illustrate really um, carefully and deliberately. And, it goes, and, and I like how you pointed out how Paul, in his letters, does this as well. Mm -hmm. He, he thanks mm -hmm. some of the women who are um, helping him in his ministry mm -hmm. and points out how some of the women are, are doing so much, sometimes monetarily, and, mm -hmm. and, and that they had status in the early Christian right. communities. And so the thing I wonder is, have you been able to trace that thread forward? So, you know, we can look at, you know, the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition and, and ethic mm -hmm. as influencing politics and science, mm -hmm. you know, going forward to our time. I wonder if you've been able to trace that forward in the development of women's rights and women's standing in society as well, because it did pass on apparently to mm -hmm. the next generation where you have the apostles and mm -hmm. Paul, mm -hmm. you know, some of those who are pointing to these things and saying, 
know, these women do have status and, mm -hmm. and worth in our society. And I wonder how far forward did that go and, and, and did it continue uh, to our time? No, it, it doesn't last long. It doesn't last long. And this is Josephine Butler's a 19th century um, uh, Christian uh, feminist. I, and I use that word specifically meaning my definition of a, my definition of the world's greatest feminist is Jesus Christ. So that's my definition of feminism. And Josephine Butler was that kind of a feminist. But she saw the kinds of constraints that were applied on women in the 19th century. It just doesn't last long. People are loath to give up power. I'm not knocking men. I don't think men are bad. But, you know, it's hard to give up power. Um, and so, you know, they're, people, once they get hold on power, it's just hard for them to let go. And people see life as a competition rather than a collaboration. They have, what's the, um, uh, Stephen Covey, what's the mentality he talks about, whether or not you have a competitive mentality or whether or not you have a, there's enough and to spare mentality is the way he kind of talks about it. But most people see the word in world in terms of competition. And so you want to get rid of your competition. And because men have inordinately held power throughout the history of mankind, women have often been at a disadvantage. But as I mentioned, that doesn't mean they didn't have power. Many women were excellent at, at exercising informal power in society. And many, and in many ways, you know, I pointed out some of the discrepancies, you know, between men's and women's lives. But in some respects, women's having a specific role and duties, that, there's, that can be liberatory too. That can give you some breathing space. All right, I know my place. I know what I need to do. I'm focusing on my family, nurturing. Women are kind of fractured in the world we live in today, aren't they? And I can remember a women's group gathering. I can't remember who was the prime minister in England, but he went down and said, okay, women, we've done it all for you. This was at a conservative party gathering. He said, we've done it all for you. You can be mothers. You can be wives. You can have jobs in the marketplace. And the women started booing him. He was like, what's going on? And they're, no, we're now working together two full-time jobs and we're exhausted all the time and a lot of men have stepped away as women have taken up those positions but women you know they have been disadvantaged over time and Jesus Christ knew that in his day and he knew it would be that way going forward and I think he endowed women with certain characteristics and abilities that are just absolutely exquisite and they bless lives the women's lives in such extraordinary ways but no they it did not persist for long and it certainly wasn't around by the 19th century as Josephine and really up in, into the 20th century women were still constrained in in many ways I mean I was around at the time of Title IX I was an athlete and I went off to BYU I'd, I'd tried out for it was a Golden State no San Francisco Warriors women's basketball team I made the team um, and it was a paid professional team. Uh, I was a senior, and uh, there was about two or 300 people that tried out, but I, I tried out, and I made the team. I, I didn't really want to be on the team. I never, they wrote me and said, you made the team, and I said, thank you, I'm going off to BYU. I just want to see if I can make it. But so when I went off to BYU, there were there was no real gym space for women. There were no scholarships for women. Maybe you could get a little bit of a grant in aid. Uh, you, the women's wore a penny. And they wore white canvas sneakers. I didn't get real athletic shoes till I worked at the Olympics in 1972. And then I got some um, Adidas. So they just didn't have the equipment. Ten years later, my sister goes off to BYU. She's a diver. Full ride scholarship, housing, but all because of Title IX. So in some ways, we've made great advances for women in the world we live in. But we're still distinctly disadvantaged. The sexual liberation of women has done nothing to help women. It has put women in a really dicey position. And then when you look at human trafficking, when you look at pornography and the perception of women in the world, women are in a really disadvantaged position in a lot of areas in the world today. But there's still a lot of things that they can do. College educations, jobs, you know, all of those are available to women. That didn't really come until the turn of the, you know, we turn into the 20th century and, and later. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things you're mentioning here about uh, you know, the Muslim world and how different it is from country to country, mm -hmm. we tend to think of the Muslims as 
and that he made it illegal for uh, women to be wearing, uh, you know, uh, headdresses, scarves, you know, in, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that made it so that if a woman wanted to remain true to religious convictions, she wasn't going to be allowed to work in the public sector because she couldn't wear, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a hijab or, or, or a scarf. Um, that's changed more recently yeah. in Erdogan, where mm -hmm. women have been more allowed to wear, you know, mm -hmm. a scarf at work. There's debate now about whether they, they want to go back on that or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so those kinds of things mm -hmm. have really um, mm -hmm. interesting and They, they followed a Western tradition of government, too, under Ataturk, which was quite helpful. British, pretty much. British, kind of that British model. And so that helps kind of, that, that helped women's rights in some respects as well. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we're going to see all varieties in Turkey. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's say uh, to uh, Dr. Frederick, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey, David Palmer, going off with those in Air Force. Hi, Jeremy Palmer, I work here to assemble.